The Future is Female is a program that aims to increase women's presence in the public sphere and to start a conversation about women's place in society. This year, our theme has been focusing on women's participation through the labor force. In Qatar, women hold the majority of bachelor's degrees, and yet we do not see that translating into the workplace. We aim to address this issue in two ways, by giving women the skills and opportunity to get their work out. We have hosted workshops in art, writing, computer science, and negotiations, in which participants were able to learn new skills and work on creating paintings, apps, and articles. Furthermore, we have an exhibition coming up in collaboration with the Qatar Art Center on April 5th called The Female Gaze, which aims to highlight women's arts. Qatar does not lack in successful women. The women you will see on the panel today will show you that, and they are just a fraction of the amazing women who are working in each field. What Qatar does lack in is a venue for women to discuss the barriers they face, and more importantly, people who acknowledge the existence of such barriers. That's why we're here today. We're here to say, yes, Qatar is full of successful women, but that doesn't mean they don't have to face barriers to get to where they are. Yes, Qatar is full of hardworking women, but that doesn't mean we get equal pay. Yes, we have women in the public sphere, but they're only welcome there if they don't transgress in the way they look and in what they say, otherwise they will get publicly crucified. Finally, I would like to take a moment to mention all the women this program couldn't yet help. The domestic workers in most houses in Qatar, who have to face, dif who have to face distance from their families, low pay, and on occasions, abuse. When I say the future is female, I do not mean that it belongs to women like myself, who have the opportunity to get their voices out. I also, we, I also mean the, the women the economy has rendered invisible. Laudable efforts have been made in order to progress domestic workers' rights, but we must not forget that it's our personal duty to ensure that they are not robbed of these rights and that they are treated with respect. I hope this conference will be an opportunity for us to discuss these issues and how we can move forward. To begin our conference, I would like to invite the Dean of Georgetown University, Dr. Ahmed Dala, to present the opening remarks. Thank you, Asma. I, I love the logo. It's, it's, it's beautiful art. Excellencies, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to Georgetown and thank you for joining us tonight for this pioneering conference organized by The Future is Female. The Future is Female is, is a, a club which was founded by our student Asma Al-Jihani who won the social venture challenge held by the Resolution Project of the UN Youth Assembly in 2017. As part of this, she received a fellowship from the Resolution Project which provides support for socially responsible young leaders and entrepreneurs. This student club, of course, Asma has um, other, other uh, students here at Georgetown who are working with her on, on, on this activity. This student club exemplifies many of the values we hold as an institution, serving the community with skills, workshops, workshops and providing a platform for women to share their work and encourage and inspire one another. The students started this program because they saw a disparity between women's education level, levels and their participation in the labor force in Qatar. They recognized that many women earn advanced degrees but are not active in the workplace and public sphere. They wished to start a conversation on women's rights and increase female participation in the labor force by providing mentorship, workshops, and networking opportunities that encourage and ease their transition into the workplace. Asma and her friends have also been supported in their efforts by workshop leaders and mentors like Dr. Amar Malki, the founding dean of, uh, of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at HBKU. This demonstrates how initiatives like this and events such as the one today are truly collaborative community efforts. At Georgetown, women comprise the majority of our student body and we're proud of that. So we witness their drive, intelligence, and ambition every day, in the classroom and beyond. Our students are diligent academics, dynamic leaders, compassionate volunteers, and thoughtful citizens of the world. We are pleased to host events such as these, which bring together successful female visionaries who are making an impact in their fields to share their experiences. The women here today are role models for the next generation, demonstrating what can be achieved through the pursuit of excellence and by taking advantage of the many opportunities available to them. 
our panelists for today, uh, Mashal Naimi, uh, Noura Suleiman, Fatima Sahlawi, and Azza Saleh, and Dr. Amal Malki, uh, are, are uh, an example of, of, the, of the achievements that we're talking about and that, uh, that we will be discussing tonight. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and supporting the student initiative. Uh, the panelists will be properly introduced by uh, one of our students, uh, Retika Ramesh, uh, in a few moments. But in conclusion, what I would like to say is that uh, we are proud of uh, this work uh, uh, and uh, we're proud of the work that our students are doing on, 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 on this front. And just uh, I would like to quickly comment that yes, the future is female and male maybe, but uh, but so is the present and the past. Welcome. Thank you, Dean Dalal. Our next speaker is Dr. Amal Malki. She is the founding dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences in HBKU, which encompasses the Masters of Arts in Women's Society and Development, the first of its kind in the region. She has also been the first supporter of this initiative and her mentorship has been invaluable. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amal Malki. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here and see these exceptional women bravely bringing us together underneath the Future is Female initiative. And as long as they are saying it, I'm happy to believe it. I've been lucky to mentor their initiative and work with Esma and her colleagues. Uh, and if there's one thing they exemplify, it is the feminist consciousness that we need to move forward in addressing women's issues in Qatar and elsewhere. Let me begin by saying that employment is a means of actualizing a woman's potential. And for women who strive to excel and compete with both men and women and contribute to national economies and also build their own livelihoods, words like aspiration, capability, and choice are not abstractions to be admired. They are tools of living to be implemented each day for any successful woman especially those who have attempted to shatter the glass ceiling. But are women really important to the workforce? Do we need women leaders? Women are important in any organization, as gender diversity leads directly to an organization's greater productivity or profitability. In 2008, for example, researcher, researchers from Maryland and Columbia University were able to provide the first evidence 2008, the first evidence that having women at senior management level is on average good for business and indisputably advantageous for specific kinds of businesses. The researchers noted that a glass ceiling has traditionally hampered American women from entering the senior management of American business. According to uh, uh, the uh, Exocom uh, database of uh, Standard & Poor, less than 500 of the largest 1,500 US firms in 2006 had promoted even one woman to their senior management. Only 30 had a female CEO. Prominent female CEOs in America are so rare that they, are, they count as minor celebrities and after their stint in the boardroom, often run for elective offices. Also, only 3% of Fortune 500 CEOs in America were women in 2006, with little increase noted by the end of 2011. So in other words, put a woman on your, your senior management team and your business will do better. What about making a woman the CEO of your organization? They found that for companies with a woman CEO, the positive correlation curiously do not hold. They have no definite explanation for this finding, but they guess that there may be something special about the CEO position. The need to be tough and inflexible, bad cop, perhaps, that neutralizes whatever overall benefit of a woman may bring to that position. 
Breaking their data down further, they found that female managers benefit a company most when the company puts a strong emphasis on knowledge and innovation and fosters a democratic and participatory rather than autocratic culture of decision making. These findings mesh well with the research on group intelligence. On average, women have higher group intelligence than men and are better able to lead teams by encouraging respect, listening, and participation, ingredients that bring out the best in team members when weighing information in order to make decisions. When a company's bottom line requires an open decision-making process or environment with democratic give and take, adding women with high group intelligence yield positive outcomes. So let's move on. There are several factors that contribute to women achievement and empowerment worldwide. Mobility and freedom is, is one of the biggest and the most important factors. But another one that resonates well to empowering young women leaders in the so-called Arab world or Arab countries is the importance of role models. Role models were found to inspire new generations of females to strive for achievement and empowerment, but not any role model. Women can more easily enter a culture of achievement when, from their youngest memories as girls, such a culture is already visible for them to enter. I've classified through my research two kinds of role models, individualized role models and strategic role models. Individualized role models are women who may inspire girls without providing models that are easy for others to emulate. Think of Angelina Jolie. Their achievement may be leveraged through wealth, social position, inheritance, or lucky circumstances that ordinary girls cannot reproduce. Strategic role models, on the other hand, are women of achievement, whose success is reproducible through instruction and training, like the young ladies we have today. Strategic role models make the roots of their success visible and reproducible for the next generation of women. Now I would like to zoom further and talk about our context here in Qatar. As more Qatari women are entering the job market, the demographics of the workforce in Qatar are shifting. The shift assumes that the numbers of Qatari women are increasing and will continue to increase. It stands at 36.7 in 2017. Women participation in Qatari force in the past decade or so has opened up many discussions about women's capabilities and had led to, has led to negotiating the traditional gender roles as well as the cultural perceptions of women working roles, especially in decision-making positions. Assuming leadership roles are the most controversial as it gives women the decision-making power over matters pertaining to the whole society, men and women, which makes her powerful. Statistics show that over the past 10 years, the numbers of economically active Qatari women assuming leadership positions ranged between 2 and 4%. And in 2009, only 3% of economically active Qatari women had leadership posts. A glass ceiling exists, whether we like it or not, for Qatari women, as they still find it difficult to reach leadership positions. And when they do, they become easy targets for sexist criticism. For example, a patriarchal discourse is generated and reproduced and recirculated on media, traditional media, social media. When one example of a woman leader fails to meet the society's expectation, and she becomes a reference to the failure of all leading women in general. So let's talk about the glass ceilings that exist in our case. Some are institutional, some are cultural biases and blind spots, and some are self-imposed, and we have to admit it. And all lead to gender discrimination and inequality. Working women, like women everywhere, have been confronted with challenges and been forced to make choices that their predecessors did not. Women whose minds are set on building careers of their own have chosen to postpone marriage plans, causing the marriage age in Qatar to steadily increase. I think I'm a, the best example here. Adding to this dynamic, working mothers are not only choosing to have fewer children, but also facing the challenge of balancing work and family. Again, fit perfectly. Meanwhile, the increase in the divorce rate in Qatar society over the past two decades has also been blamed on the number of women in employment. 
Another social phenomenon that has become evident as a reaction of the growing number of women joining this, this segregated workplaces is the increased number of women opting to wear the niqab, the full face veil, as a culturally acceptable form of achieving freedom and a mobility in a public environment and whilst working alongside men. So they can conform to, to a culturally acceptable form uh, of attire, but at the same time have the mobility to move. This effortless but still dramatic increase in the number of women in the workplace implies that the workplace has been modified right, to embrace the growing number of working women, and they are equal to men in terms of opportunities and compensation. However, that's not true. Although in principle all positions are open to women, cultural considerations continue to, to determine the roles deemed acceptable and available to women. Women are still restricted in terms of choices and mobility. Women are also still under social, cultural, and even legal restrictions that mean that men do not experience, such as guardianship and travel restrictions. For example, a woman under the age of 25 cannot travel without a guardian's permission, despite the fact that a woman at that age uh, most probably is a graduate, and maybe with a master's degree, and holding a full-time position. In terms of pay and compensation, according to Qatar Labor, uh, Labor Law, Part 9, Article 93, women should be paid equally for performing the same job as a man. However, in reality, women do not get paid equally, and their benefits do not compare to those of men. Between spouses, for example, the man obtains marriage-related allowances, while the woman needs to prove her eligibility to claim the same. And as if to add insult to injury, married, divorced, and widowed women get even further reduced benefits. All the statistics show that men are earning more than women for performing the same job. And while this is a global phenomenon, of course, not unique to Qatar, it should not be happening anywhere. Moreover, if all these issues women face, of all those wish, uh, issues women face, the one that most needs to be urgently addressed is that of sexual harassment in the workplace. Unfortunately, sexual harassment is a social taboo that is barely talked about or tackled in formal or informal public conversations. Far too many incidents of all different forms of sexual harassment go unreported, resulting in women choosing to leave their jobs because of their justifiable uh, fear of having to take the blame, because we are a culture that blames the victim. As so often is the case in patriarchal societies, women are expected to pay the price for, for men's um, misconduct. The lack of sexual harassment laws mirrors the lack of laws in general to protect women from different forms of abuse, for example, domestic violence. It has no law. There is a desperate need, first and foremost, to challenge the prevailing perception of women in general, and specifically working women. This needs to go hand in hand with coordinated campaign or campaigns to promote strategic role models, strategic role models, were done with cosmetic role models using both traditional and new media. A special focus needs to target the new generation of modern Qatari women who don't necessarily look the same. Qatari women who are keen on competing with both men and women in education and in the job market to become an integral part of the building of our nation. Women's associations needs to be established and the voices calling for new legal and practical frameworks to give women real equality need to be embraced and accepted. The government and its official platforms need to take responsibility for supporting working women through educating and reshaping society's perceptions of women's roles and developing gender-sensitive legislation that is fair to women and that protects them in both the public and the private spheres. There is a lot to be done, but we are becoming a critical mass of women whose cause is gender equality. So change is possible. I would like to conclude and say that the young Qatari woman, the woman of and the woman of Qatar are the future. So please lead the way for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Now for the panel, please welcome Ritka Ramesh, junior at GUQ and member of the Futures female team. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Today, we have a group of young, diverse, and uncoupled women 
who have each made not notable contributions to their respective fields. First, we have Mishael al Naimi. Mishael is a president of community development at Qatar Foundation and has a rich career in business and law. She successfully represented Qatar at multiple institutions all around the world, including the UN and the World Bank. Please join me in welcoming Michelle to the stage. <laughs> Fatma Al Sahlawi is a founder of Atlas Bookstore in Qatar and is a pioneer in the field of architecture and public design. She has worked as a master planner and architect at various projects and institutions, including Qatar museums. We are so honored to have you here with us today. Please join us on the stage. <laughs> Noura al Suleiman is one of the leading experts on human rights in the Gulf. She is a course administrator at IMF in Kuwait and is a student outreach coordinator of Ensaniyat, a project that aims at spreading knowledge about migrant and domestic workers in the Gulf through social awareness. We are so grateful that Noura agreed to fly in from Kuwait to join us here today. Thank you so much, Noura. <laughs> Azza Salah is a founder and CEO of Sky Climbers for talent training and production. She is also the head of strategic planning and performance for academics at Qatar University. Azza has also written a best-selling book about entrepreneurship and leadership. With a deep interest in the arts and culture, she was also the assistant director of the State of Qatar in the Center for Cultural and Heritage Events. Please join us here on stage. Once again, welcome to the Futurist Female Conference, and we look forward to hearing you all talk about your empowered stories and experiences. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to first start off by thanking um, the group of students who really allowed for this platform today for us to engage and discuss such important topics. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank each and every one of you who have come here today to hear from us. And I hope that we can take this cause forward. Um, just a bit about myself. I think um, I've been blessed in that I've, I have three very strong uh, role models in my life to the point that you were mentioning, Dr. Ahmed. Um, the first one is my father. I think that um, from a very young age, he always uh, would sit and ask myself, my sisters and brothers, but particularly the girls, um, what we wanted to, you know, who we wanted to be, what we wanted to achieve, and how we would contribute. And he didn't direct us in what that would mean, but constantly asking us that question really shaped who we are today. Um, and he also stood, I think one of the things he said to us as uh, children was, uh, and I'll say it in Arabic, Ya binti dirasa aw shahada hi salah al mar'a. Meaning, a, a, a loose translation is, uh, your education is your tool for empowerment. Uh, and that was something that resonated throughout our lives. Um, and when I went on to decide that I was going to study law, uh, especially at that time, not a lot of women went out to study abroad, first and foremost, and very fewer actually went out to study law. And there was a lot of uh, challenge, particularly from the family and the others who felt that, you know, why would you allow her to go on to study law, which is a male-dominated field, and what will she come back to be, and that would potentially... Um, you know, the, the, the social implications of that. Um, but he stood behind that decision and I therefore went out to study law and I'll discuss that in a bit. Um, the second role model in my life uh, was my mother. And I, I, I think I'm very blessed in that. Um, she is a, uh, a chairperson and CEO of a holding company with a very diverse portfolio. And as a child, and I think I've only come to really understand that dynamic once I became a mother myself, um, but the importance of um, role modeling herself for us and also balancing that act. And we never felt a day where, for example, she wasn't there for us or she didn't. Um, she was very uh, instrumental in, for example, goal setting and being aspirational and for us constantly pushing to achieve and striving for that. You know, she would never uh, approve of just settling uh, for what we're doing. Um, and there were, it was always the question of, okay, what are you going to achieve next? We, growing up, we had, I think, the most packed schedule. It was from uh, languages to ballet to the arts. Uh, summer holidays never were just normal summer holidays. They were us, you know, doing reports at the end of every week of what we did and what we achieved. Um, but again, I think as a child, you know, we complained a lot. <laughs> but growing up, I really see the benefits of um, the structured and how the structured childhood and how she constantly was a role model for us there. 
The third role model, and I think she's a role model for many uh, in the country and beyond, is Her Highness Sheikha Moza bint Nasser. Um, she was a real trailblazer, and she allowed us to, to aspire and to think that we also could achieve something greater than what our mothers or generations be before us did. Uh, and I feel very honored that I'm able to work with her now um, as a young adult. I really am, uh, I think, blessed in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, when I went out to study law, that was, you know, it was, it was wonderful. But when I came back was when, uh, I think having gone to private schools and everything, you, you live in this kind of uh, bubble. Uh, and when I went into the workforce, that's when I really had my first um, realization of the challenge of what people meant when they say it's a male-dominated field. Just a statistic, and this is years ago, uh, you have 75% of females who enter the law school, and yet less than 8% make up uh, the female workforce for lawyers, that is. And it was something I was very interested in, and I felt it. Uh, so as a, when I joined the, the workforce, I went for a um, private law firm. Uh, and one of the reasons was because I didn't know that I wanted to go to courts and so forth. And I had my first experience when I went to court. It was, it was uh, not a very pleasant experience because uh, you are a minority and you're trying to represent clients and you might be before a whole panel of male judges and there's all that kind of dynamics that you're trying to go through. Um, but the bigger challenge as a, uh, as a lawyer was really your clients, particularly the Qatari clients, might be your father's friends, for example, and so they see you as their daughter or you know your brother's friends. And so no matter what you do, you are that you're boxed into either a Qatari lawyer or a female Qatari lawyer, and then that makes it even tougher. Um, and that made me desire to go on to do my master's. Um, I'd already done a master's in um, international business and finance, um, but I went on to do another master's in uh, international business economic law. And thereafter, I wanted to do the New York Bar. And the driving force behind uh, doing the New York Bar was because, um, again, it was for me trying to find what would be the highest ceiling that I could attain as a lawyer that would allow people to look at me as a lawyer and not as a Qatari female lawyer in front of them. Uh, and I, I'm thankful for that because it meant that I went on to be the first individual, male or female, to get the Qatari Bar, uh, sorry, the New York Bar. And um, everyone said you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't bother because there's a 73% uh, failure rate for international lawyers going on to do it. And that's actually, as opposed to it making me think, oh gosh, you know, I don't want to have that failure rate on my CV, it actually was the driving force behind me going to, um, to do that. Um, Fast forwarding on my career, I went, uh, one of my ex-clients called me and uh, said, hey, we want you to come and join Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We have this UN convention on climate change, uh, COP18, and we'd like you to come in. My first reaction was, well, I'm not an environmental lawyer. I'm not, I mean, that's not the kind of thing I do. And he was like, yes, but we need it. It's transferable skills. Come on. And oh, by the way, you have eight months to deliver. Um, and it was really, really interesting. We got sent, you know, to um, the UN. We represented Qatar. We went to uh, the World Bank, Ban Ki Moon's office. We had this special training. But um, as amazing as that was, the experience in the ministry area was what actually made me leave and go back to the private sector, because um, at that point, I think in the, in the earlier years in my career, it was a bit easier, especially as I went up. When you go in to lead. Um, a group, and, and those majority of them will be male. Uh, there, again, there was that dynamics of the difficulty of trying to um, get them to either, uh, it's that inherent authority that you're trying to get them to respect, and it was always uh, a challenge. And the environment in of itself was something that I felt, um, did I, I mean, I loved representing Qatar, and I loved the international traveling and so forth, and it was such a dynamic experience, but I wanted to go back to the private sector, which is more of a, uh, I think the challenges are not, as prominent, and I enjoyed the work that I was doing when I was uh, at ExxonMobil. Um, but that I think, and I still see it, the difference between private sector and government sector, it's, it's a, um, a very different uh, experience when you're working in both. Um, after that I joined, I transitioned from uh, ExxonMobil, I worked in the oil and gas sector, and then I transitioned uh, to completely left the legal field. Um, and again, a big part, I mean, I love, everyone says, you know, how do you feel after leaving mm -hmm. Laura? I love practicing as a lawyer, um, but I felt that for myself I'd reached a ceiling. There wasn't, a, had I not left the private sector, within the government sector, I couldn't see where my career trajectory would be. And that was one of the, the key reasons that I left the field, although I, my, my heart and passion is still, uh, I loved you know, practicing as a lawyer. 
Um, but I left it, I moved into business. I worked for a private uh, family holding company. And, that was, and then uh, last year, I was, uh, or just under a year, I was appro um, approached to join Qatar Foundation as the president of community development. And I remember when I saw the uh, job description, I was like, well, what, what is community development? And, and what does that mean? And what am I supposed to do? And uh, I mean, I took on the challenge. And all of last year was a really interesting year because it was about um, building up the pillar, getting the division up and running, recruiting, putting the policies and procedures, and all of that was the fun stuff. And the challenging thing that I think I, I've, you know, at each stage in your career, you, you face a different challenge. And last year was a great eye opener for me uh, when we talk about a lack of female in leadership positions. Uh, a big part of my role is to go out and engage and go to the openings of all these different events and to show and represent Qatar Foundation, and you know, it's great. But um, when you get to these events, they have like the medjlis. Uh, pre -event. And oftentimes you get there and it's very, very awkward to be sitting because you're meant to network and um, how do you break that ceiling when all of the CEOs of the banks, of the organizations, all the, are men, when all the ministers aside from us are men. And when you're sitting there sometimes, especially when you go down to the nitty gritty of how the seating is, if, if there's no kind of, um, if it's just a bench kind of uh, seating, then you're like, how do you get your way in between them and where do you sit? And so I didn't think of that in my first interaction, but after I got you know, the protocol team, I'm like, make sure you have somewhere reserved for me so I don't interrupt everyone as I try to find a seat. Because it gets very awkward for the other males when you're trying to find a way, because again, you are the wife of so-and-so, you are the sister of so-and-so. And no matter, I think, what you do, you'll always, um, because of the cultural dynamics, there will always be that. Um, and, and you have to sit, and I think I'm a relatively social individual who doesn't shy away from uh, you know, b breaking the ice, but I, 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 in those instances, it really is tough because you have to think of how do I, when you know, two men are talking over you because they're both CEOs of an organization and they know each other very well and they hang out in medjlis and you know, deals are done in those areas, how do I as a female overcome that medjlis interaction? Um, and I can't say I found the answer or the solution, um, but I do try and find, you know, if I know something's being discussed at a medjlis and I try to get some people to share that information, I'll make sure I have an appointment with that CEO the next day to kind of say, oh, you know, so I understood that this is being discussed and to really push your way. And when Dr. Emma mentioned um, the ceiling that sometimes we impose on ourselves, I think definitely that's one of them because you have to be really strong to push yourself and to find that very fine uh, balance between being too forward because then you're not gonna be able to affect the social change that you want to, but also being forward enough to break that ceiling, to go in and say, hi, yes, I'm shy and I'd love to discuss. Um, but I, and that's why I'm, I'm really happy that we have this platform today and, and I hope that we have very interactive session and questions from all of you. Thank you. Um, hello everyone and thank you um, for inviting me over. Um, such a great initiative, and I'm very curious to see how it moves forward and starts to sort of um, implement all these different um, goals it has. Um, I'm going to share a very personal experience with sort of the field of architecture and urbanism that I've been trained into. Um, when I graduated from high school, I, I almost did, had no idea of what I wanted to do, what I wanted to study, where I wanted to study. I knew I was good, very good in this sort of practical design field, but I also knew that I was sort of also really good in the science field as well. And I found different descriptions of architectural programs under different, um, um, in different websites of different universities. And when I went back to my parents and told them I wanted to become an architect and study architecture, they were delighted because it was at a time when they almost, everyone almost anticipated this development boom happening in Qatar. It was at a time when um, Qatar was sort of tr starting to invite all these world-renowned reno architects to come for different projects. So architecture was a very sort of attractive field to look into, yet there was this big gap in the local market, in the local sort of uh, professional market um, of architects, be they male or female. So I was, I was 16 at the time, and my mom was very reluctant to almost let me leave straight away, right? So I looked at options here, what options I had, and zero options, no architectural programs. Um, the next option was to look at the, re either do 
another year of, of um, A-levels A -levels here in Doha or to look at the region. I found an amazing program in the region at the American University of Sharjah, and I decided that's where I'm going to study architecture. The next step was to apply for a scholarship. And as soon as I went into uh, the scholarship office, I remember the advisor, as soon as she heard architecture, she was like, why? You're going to come back, not finding a job, number one. Number two, if you find a job, you can't go on site. You can't deal with construction workers. Um, you, you can't sort of practice field, field work, and, which, which the profession definitely demands. And I wasn't convinced. I went back home and I told my parents, and my parents were like, she, she, it's just a misconception of the profession. And unfortunately, this misconception does not only take place here in Qatar, but it's a worldwide sort of phenomenon where you look around and read about architects internationally, and it is a male-dominant field. Anyways, I did go ahead and study architecture, and I came back and started working at uh, Qatari DR at the time. And automatically, I was given sort of the admin tasks to take care of. I almost became a project manager where I had to take care of correspondences, communications, um, legal work, anything but architecture, anything but design, anything but the sort of creative side of what I had studied. I came back being able to do all of these different tasks because of the nature of an architectural degree, yet, I mean, there was a huge gap in what, what I wanted to practice. Um, I found that I had to sort of either change that misconception within the organization I was working at, or I had to find a different place where they would sort of encourage such creativity rather than try to um, inhibit it. And that's when I decided to move to another organization, Qatar Museums. And what happened there was they promoted, my, pro promoted the profession from the very first day. In terms of, they were very sort of encouraging in terms of me leaving the office. That was, that was something that I did not face in the first job. I was, instead, I, we became the sort of introverted group of female designers. Um, and and n n not to sort of also forget to mention that designers was a very broad term, broadly used term. No, what, no sort of differentiation whatsoever between an architect or graphic designer, interior designer, we're all designers, the creatives that were put in one office. But then at Qatar Museums, it was very much the, the, the sort of opposite of that. We were encouraged to um, go out on field visits, oral histories, meet people, approach people, become more proactive rather than reactive. We weren't in the offices waiting for a task. Instead, we became proactive where we found sort of different projects that we could initiate, different initiatives, and we went out there and started to propose them to people. And it sort of straight away changed my um, feeling of the profession when I came back after studying, but it also changed a lot of other people's perception of, of architecture. A few years of that, and then I almost reached a ceiling of, of what I was able to offer within an organization like that. I felt like there was more that I could do for Qatar, for the architecture and urbanism field in Qatar. However, I did not have the liberty to do that within such a big organization with um, many sort of rules and regulations and the organizational structure itself having to go through specific routes to get something done. And I found that maybe it was time for me to take everything I learned from all the different sort of places I worked at and try to do something on my own. Um, I decided to do two things. One thing that I was most passionate about, working with books, collecting books, researching through books. So that's a bookstore and a library. And then in parallel was the more creative and practical side of things, and that's an architecture studio. And I did that with a male partner. He's an ex-colleague of mine. And um, fortunately, it's a perfect sort of balance of male and female within this sort of small team. And we're also... A I mean, the acceptance we get when we go to different clients or different governmental entities is very much surprising that they're willing to hear more from me than from Nasser, who's my, uh, my, my male partner. And it's almost relieving to him. 
he doesn't want to face people. He doesn't want to face clients. He wants to sit there and, and get the job done when he knows what, what, what is to be done. I, on the other hand, I'm sort of very social. I want to go out there, learn from, from um, different clients and different uh, groups of people that we're targeting for different projects. And so it, I almost now get to do what I believe this profession is meant to be doing, right? Socially, but also in a, in a, professional, um, in a professional way. So going back to this misconception of d specific professions, in my case, it was architecture. I think it, we internationally, yes, it applies to, to the global sort of professional market, but specifically to Qatar, if I was to speak about it, Qatar University started offering an, a degree in architecture, and the first graduating batch graduated in 2014. And since then, they have almost 30 female architects graduating each year. And, you all, and they almost disappear. After I see them in their very last design review, they almost disappear as architects. They either join different governmental entities and become, again, project managers, admin. A few of them have moved to HR. Not, almost none of them are practicing. Or they sort of find they can't find the right sort of route to practice this profession, and so they almost give up on it um, soon, soon after they graduate. And so I believe that as part of what I feel like my responsibility to do now that I'm um, working through my private initiatives is to also raise this awareness and understanding of what the profession is, uh, that there is a major need for it in Qatar, uh, because architecture, again, is not just a creative sort of profession, it's a social profession, it's a, it's a socio-political profession, and, and it can go on to sort of cover multidisciplinary um, um, aspects of projects and developments that are happening in Qatar. And um, I really hope that through this platform, we can also th sort of start to look at that, the misconception of professions locally. And thank you. Hello. Um, before coming here, and when Esma reached out and spoke to me about this conference, I was worried because I knew I wouldn't have a similar kind of path to share. Um, but I will start off, and I came up until now, up until coming on stage, I did not have a speech in mind. I did not have a topic in mind. And, uh, but I knew I was going to be influenced, and I was firstly by Mashail. So I will share first a story about my role model. My role model is my father, uh, was, is, and always will be. And my father was a diplomat for 36 years of his life, and he had traveled the world, and he has represented my country, Kuwait, so dearly and so passionately in the world of politics and diplomacy. And I always aspired to be like him. However, I also always wanted to be a lawyer. When we moved back to Kuwait in 2008, I would always talk about my role model, Nabil al-Mullah as well, who was the first female ambassador in the Arab region. And this was back when women did not go out, uh, Kuwaiti women did not go out, GCC women did not go out, and Arab women as a whole did not go out. And I saw Nabil al-Mullah when she was our ambassador in Vienna in 2001, and I just wanted to have that power. I wanted to be like her, the woman that was leading those embassies, that was, lead, that we, was leading these diplomats. And when we came back to Kuwait, people asked me, who did you want to be like? What did you want to do? What, where do you want to work? And being in middle school, it was still law. And I wanted to study law. I wanted to become a lawyer. Uh, but I always said that I want to work in the ministry like my father. I want to become a diplomat like my father, and I want to be the future ambassador of Kuwait like Nabil al-Mullah. However, the response was always, but no one's going to marry you if you become a diplomat. Uh, do you really think your husband is going to travel the world with you? Do you really think your husband's going to follow you around from embassy to embassy or from country to country? And keep in mind, this was when I was in grade eight. And it did not make sense, because in grade eight, I was thinking about break, I was thinking about summer, I was thinking about spring. I did not think about whether or not my husband is going to follow me from country to country. I graduated, and then I did not get to study law. 
because there was outside pressure where it was, there was always this criticism towards my father where it's like, are you really going to let her go abroad and study law? Uh, I will say it in Arabic, uh, but none of this made sense because I came from a very open family and because it was the five of us who traveled from one country to the other, it was the five of us who understood each other and understood each other's passions. So I also had in mind that my father wanted me to go to the American University of Kuwait and study international relations, strictly political and absolutely not what I wanted. I graduated with a degree in politics in 2013, and it was still, what are you going to do? Oh, I want to become a diplomat, like my father. I want to apply to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, lead the way of diplomacy like my father and Nabil al-Mullah did. And again, who's going to marry you? So I spoke about this at a GCC summit in 2016, where it was a summit for, dedicated to GCC girls. And we talked about the role of a woman. So I stood up and I said, why is it that whenever I say I want to become a diplomat, the automatic response is, who's going to marry you? I believe that if a female wants to do that, she can do that. If a female wants to travel from one country to the other, just like her husband expects that support from her, then she should expect and get that support from him. It's not about female or male, it's just about that support between two people. And I was criticized for it. After the conference, uh, I was approached by one of the speakers who told me that someone from a specific country in the GCC uh, had a complaint about me and said that <laughs> she, this, uh, why is this girl trying to change the mindsets of our daughters and of our girls? And none of it made sense. I was lucky though, because I did grow up and I was and I do come from a society that does support female role models. Like I said, Nabil al-Mullah. And we also have Dr. Anud al-Sharikh, who is founder of uh, Abolish 153, who does fight for women's rights. We have uh, Ambassador Reem al-Khalid, who is the former ambassador of Cuba for Kuwait. And she was also someone that I grew up watching in Vienna. And I wanted to be like them. And I, I saw how people spoke about them. And I saw how they were able to lead. And they did not get criticized for what they were doing. So why is it that I have to change what I wanted to do? So I feel lucky in a way that I didn't feel like I had to change a societal norm. Uh, or I, had, I didn't have to change a societal mindset that a woman can't, only in the term of diplomacy and traveling the world. but. When it comes to NGOs, when it comes to projects, when it comes to civil society, I feel like I'm blessed to have come from a country that allows you to do that. I was lucky to have found Migrant Rights Org, under which I was able to start Insaniyat, which is a social awareness project aimed at spreading awareness about migrant and domestic workers' rights. Because every time I stepped out of Kuwait, I would hear these stories about domestic workers being abused. I would hear stories about or why is this person hanging themselves? Or why is this government not doing this? Or why is this person? But then I realized that there, there, this does not make sense because we do have these laws. We do have uh, articles. We do have so many things that do protect these workers. So I wanted to do something that I was passionate about and not something that I wanted to be, and it was law. So I taught myself law. And because it was a passion of mine, I was able to do it very easily. And I taught myself all about migrant workers' law. And I taught myself all about my, uh, domestic workers' rights. And the history behind this law and the politics behind this uh, law, the politics again. And within Insaniyat, I was lucky enough to have been able to lead successful campaigns. We led gallery campaigns, we led uh, events, we led social media campaigns where members of parliaments themselves then approached us and to uh, told us that, please give us your suggestions for these laws. Please uh, let us know how can we change, what can we do? But then there was the smaller part of the Kuwaiti society that I had to deal with. And it was, um, with all due respect to them, a lot of our, my parents' friends and the female friends of the family, in gatherings, they would constantly, when I tried to talk to them about domestic rights in gatherings, their automatic response is, 
you're just thinking with your emotions. What do you mean give her her passports? What do you mean let her go out? What do you mean she can wear whatever she wants outside the house? Uh, don't be emotional. Don't think, don't sympathize. And I didn't see it as being emotional. I'm very sure the people that wrote and drafted and signed these laws were not trying to sympathize with workers. They were not trying to uh, think about whether or not this worker uh, is, is going to be happier if she was able to work. No, they thought about their rights as workers. They thought about their rights as human beings. But because, and now that I think about it, maybe because I am a girl that's talking about these rights, it was more about me being sympathetic towards people and me being sympathetic towards workers or me being emotional. And maybe that's why I was trying to fight for these laws. I ignored all of that. Mm-hmm. And once again, because I come from a society that supports NGOs and supports going out, experimenting with different projects, being flexible with all these different projects, I was able to succeed with Insaniyat. And I was also able to be applauded by men, women, uh, students, people who cared, about, who cared about laws and people who did not know anything about these laws. And I feel blessed. Maybe I was lucky in a sense that I didn't always have to fight the battle of, oh, I'm a woman, I can't do this, or I'm a woman, please do listen to me. And I do hope that the different societies around us do adopt this kind of mindset, that it's not about a gender and it's not about a man or a female, it's just about if this person is capable of making change, if this person is capable of doing something positive in their society or adding to their society, then they should go ahead and get that chance to do so without having to fight the barrier of I'm a female or I'm a male or cultural norms or religious norms or any sense of norms because Time is progressing and we can't be stuck to the same old traditions of no, you can't, no, we don't have girls that go out, or no, we cannot study abroad, or no, we cannot travel abroad, like Dr. Amel Malki said. But more about, okay, this person can do a change, so just let them make that change without having to fight a battle of something that does not make sense. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. First of all, before I kick off with my keynote, let's say, like my first speech, I would like to say thank you to all the girls who welcomed us today and who invited us today. This is an amazing initiative. When I was at your age, I wished if I had something like this. So thank you so much for having this initiative to empower all the ladies and all the women. You are the future leaders. You are the one who are going to make the change. It's not us, it's in your hand, and it's all of our hands. So clap, Yani. I want a big round of applause for all the people who organized this initiative. <laughs> and the second round of applause for all the male who are with us today. So wallah, they deserve, they deserve another one. <laughs> Uh, my name is Azza Salah. Um, a lot of people, when I start to speak about myself and before they like welcome me, they always say like, Azza, the CEO, the founder of Sky Climber Company, the company that won the best business project award for Qatar for the year of 2017, the company that it, it is in Guinness World Record book. And uh, she, is, she has the bestseller book, which is called Be a Successful Leader. She is also the section head for institutional planning and performance at Qatar University. It's a huge, huge title. When people look at me and see all these things about me, the first thing I say, I'm a woman before all of that. So today, because we are here talking about women and talking about women empowerment, I would like just to take you through a trip, uh, through a journey. When we were kids, there is no, there is no like you're a woman and that's a, that's a male and you cannot go there and you can't go there. I used to play with my brother's friend. We used to go out in the street. We used to wear whatever we want to wear. And then I reached the difficult age. We reached the age of 16, 17, 18. Things started to change. My brother's friend are no longer my friend. <laughs> I can't ride my bicycles outside. I have to wear this, I have to wear that. I can't stay outside of the home without, without having my mother with me. I can't go anywhere. I can't travel. Like, why? Because you're a woman. I didn't get it. Like, why? Why? Because I'm a woman. I can't ride on my bicycle. I can't have my male. My brother's friend, they're still as, as my friend because we grew up together. They're like my friend. No, they look at you differently. 
So from that age, you have to not only take care of yourself, but also take care of what people think of you, which is very difficult. Like for me, to, to, to control myself and to control the way I look and to control the way I behave is so easy, but to control the society is so difficult. So since that age, I realized, and I've, I've been told that that's the society that you grow up in, and that's the life that you are in, so deal with it. I was like, fine. Since the age of 16, all the girls who are my age, they used to go to like city center, and they used to go to like landmark, and they used to like wear like some makeup and do like crazy things, because we're, we're women, like we have to. We have to look pretty. Like, why you have to look pretty? You have to look smarter. So since the age of 16, I started working. I started working in the Ministry of Art and Culture, not because I applied for a job, because I was so talented. They're like, we want to use, we want to record your voice in one of the Qatar uh, songs. I was like, hell yeah, I want to do that. We're going to give you 1,000 riyal. I want to do that. <laughs> I was 16. Give me 1,000 riyal. I'm a woman. 1,000 riyal just to record one line. I go to school and I invite all my friends to cinema without taking any penny from my dad. How cool is that? Being independent. <laughs> I've learned the art of being an independent woman. I started to call the ministry. Do you have any new recording songs? <laughs> and that's when I know the, 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 the strength of becoming independent. Not a woman, independent. I started to grow up, I was like, I wanna be more than this. I don't wanna just record my voice. So when I used to record my voice, I used to like add my notes. I was like, can we add this sentence? Can we add that? I started to become expert in culture. So they started to invite me to all the operate and the, all the theoretical musics and the performances that they're doing having in Qatar. And I used to come and watch, and I used to really watch. All my friends used to go to cinemas, I used to walls and stuff like this. I used to work in my brain. I used to work to become even more stronger than today. Not because I'm a woman, but because I wanted to become independent. I love independency. I started to go, and then by the age of 19, because of observing all the, all the performances and learning from the, assist, from the director, I saw the director out there, I was like, who is that man who has the power to control above 1,000 people in a, in, a, in a big place, opening the big theaters in Doha and having uh, uh, the, the Sheikh uh, Amir al-Walid, uh, the father prince, uh, Sheikh, Timi, uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa al Thani, uh, having him in, in the first line and doing this opening and these things, I was like, I want to be that. I want to be the woman behind that show that everyone from the royal family come to attend to watch it. So by the age of 19, I became the assistant director. And we started to make theoretical shows, not only in Qatar, but also outside of Qatar. And my biggest accomplishment, when I was 20 years old, in Korea, Expo, we won the first, uh, the first place in Qatar as me being having also the assistant director for the show uh, worldwide among all the countries in the expo. So for me, I loved, the second thing that I've loved in my life was accomplishments. It feels so good. <laughs> so you have your own money. No one can tell you, no, you can't because you have your own money. <laughs> no one can tell you you can't buy that car because you have your own money. And, th and fourth is like, you're accomplishing things. Your friends are calling you, are calling you, it's like, hey, we saw you in the news. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> it felt so good. And guess what? When society started to like, look at me as a woman, I said like, let's play. If I am a woman, let's play the card of a woman. So when I used to go to the bank, <laughs> I'm a woman, I have to go first. I used to play it very well. So my lesson here, the thing I'm trying to tell you, if someone is trying to neglect you or look at you in a different perspective or, or put you in a, in a specific frame, play in that frame, be smarter. <laughs> I'm a woman, I cannot stand in the line for a very long time. I don't have a male with me. I'm a woman, you have to get me the seat next to the window in the airplane because I'm a woman. <laughs> So you can request and ask for anything you want in the world. It's amazing. It's so powerful being a woman. So I love that. I love being a woman. I don't want to go through all my, my 
educational life because when I wanted to study media, I'm a graduate of mass communication program, my dad said, no, you have to study, you have to become an engineer or you have to be a doctor. I'm a science, uh, I'm a science stream uh, uh, graduate from high school. So I was like, why? He's like, because uh, you can't find a job. I was like, I'm already working. <laughs> why? He's like, no, uh, girls should not be in TV and stuff like this. It's, it's a talent. You should be smarter than, than this. I was like, if I worked in something that I love, if I studied something that I love, that will become my passion and that will become my source of income. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm using my talent as my source of income. And that's how I got introduced to become, to become the assistant director by the age of 19 years old. So I went to, to, to the university just for the sake of like telling him that yani, yani, I looked to all the options. I applied to international affairs, I applied to law, and I applied to mass communication. I got accepted in all. And I chose mass communication. And after one semester, I told him, Dad, I'm already in mass communication program. Why I took my own decision because I'm independent. I can pay for my fees, I can pay for all my things, and my dad doesn't even know. My point of the things that I'm saying, my dad doesn't know, but that doesn't mean that I don't respect his opinion. His opinion really matters. What, he's, he, what he was saying back then, he's like, you're young, I know, you're, I know, you, um, I know what could suit you, suits you in your future better than you. But later on, he started to accept the fact that I'm the media graduate who won the best business, who won the, the leadership award in Qatar University in Imagine. Do you know the number of students at Qatar University are 19,000? 19,000. And I won the leadership award for Qatar University. So, and I, also, um, I was also in the dean's list and I was also a very, a very good student. So he started to accept the fact that if you followed your passion, regardless of your gender, Regardless of, of, of whatever you are doing, you're gonna, be, you're gonna do great. So I, grad, I graduated from the stream of mass communication. Uh, and when I graduated, I went to Qatar Airways to work there. I worked for two years. Back then, I was still the assistant. Oh, by the way, I left uh, the Ministry of Art and Culture. I left the Ministry of Art and Culture when I was uh, 23, 23 years old. All my, my dad told me, like, why are you leaving the Ministry of Art and Culture? It's so great. I was like, I graduated. He's like, what does that got to do with it? I was like, no, I want a new accomplishment in my life. I'm a woman, but the sky is always the limit. So I left them. I was like, I can always come back to them. I became a person with a value. Not a woman with a value, a person with a value. So I shifted and I went to Qatar Airways. I worked for Qatar Airways for two years. And I left them. Why I left Qatar Airways? He's like, why are you leaving Qatar Airways? We get free tickets. <laughs> and he was like, I was like, Dad, I'm a person with a value. I learned whatever I can learn from Qatar Airways. Now I need to leave. And he's like, why do you need to leave? I told him, like, I have an idea of opening a business. I wanted to become an entrepreneur, and I didn't even know what entrepreneurship means. But not for the fact that I wanted to become an entrepreneur and to go to the path of entrepreneurship. It's just because of the fact that in one Saturday, uh, in one Saturday, in, in a Saturday, I had a dream that I have something called Sky Climber, and I had a dream of the logo and everything. And I woke up, I can't remember, I can't forget that day, and I I, I, I hold my phone and I started to write Sky Climbers for talented youth. And I went to my sister, Sarah, who studies in Georgetown here, at Georgetown University. I was like, Sarah, I have this crazy idea of opening a club, a club, and see, this is what I'm taking you. It was an initiative. I want to open this initiative, this club that's called the Sky Climbers. She's like, yeah, go for it. She didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> She's like, yeah, go for it. Why she told me go for it, that's the perfect environment that you need to be in. The second phone call was for my friend. And I was like, I don't want to mention her name. Hey, I have this crazy idea, I want to open something called Sky Climber. And the first thing she told me like, man, sledge. It's like, are you serious? <laughs> let's just go to the mall, let's do something. A lot of the girls decide that they want to stay wherever society has labeled them. 
other girls look at them, look at themselves, not, not like what other societies are trying to tell them, like you have to be in that label. Other girls like us today, and, and I know like all the audience and whoever is with us today have that potential, have that understanding that they can become someone with a value. When you are someone with a value, that gender doesn't really matter. So I opened Sky Climber, and eventually it became a company. I applied for MBA, I got rejected. I was like, okay, fine. Why I got rejected? They're like, you're too young. By the way, I'm 26 years old. They're like, you're too young. I was like, I'm too young for MBA. They're like, yeah, you have to get like two years of experience. I was like, I have nine years of experience at the Ministry of Art and Culture. They're, they said like, you have to have two years after the graduation date. So what I did, I was like, okay, you don't want to teach me MBA? I'm going to make my company the best company. And I won the best business project award in Qatar for the year of 2017, that company. And I did not even study MBA. And guess what? They offered me a job, Qatar, uh, Qatar University. And I went and, I, and now I'm working at Qatar University and I met the dean back then, who was the dean of the MBA. I'm the, I'm, I'm the section head for institutional planning and performance for the academic. So I, I, um, I take control of nine colleges at Qatar University, including business school. So I went to the person who rejected me. I was like, doctor, remember me? He's like, no. I was like, I'm the girl who you rejected when I applied for my MBA program. And guess what? My company already won the best business project award, and now I'm the section head for the academics. So your college follows under me. <laughs> How crazy is that? And guess what, doctor? I'm 26 years old. Damn. So, what I'm trying to tell you here, ah, and then, <laughs> I'm gonna complete my stories. I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being very friendly with you because I think the environment is, is mostly friendly. So, when I left Qatar Airways, I didn't have a job. I left all my work to open Sky Climber. I was a pure entrepreneur. I left everything that I do in my life, and I was like, I have to concentrate of opening this sky climber. So I, I used to go to Harvard Business School online and just to take some classes online, teach myself what is value proposition, what is customer validation, what is all these different terms that I didn't even know about. So during that period of time, it's very difficult when you are an entrepreneur to wake up in the morning. Like there is no, you, you don't need to go to work. So what, what what, yani, for the first month, I used to like sleep the whole day. I didn't know what to do with my life. It was a very difficult, difficult time of my life. So being an entrepreneur and opening this new business and the Sky Climber, it's a training company. Um, I developed this training program for talents and youth in terms of the, in, in the art and media programs. Uh, we use the Australian methodology for teach, for learning, which is 70-20-10. 70 of the learning is based on uh, practical experience, 20% is networking, and 10% is only theoretical classes. Uh, and I developed a way of how we can attract mostly uh, the youth to our organization or to our company in order for them to develop their skills and also to secure jobs for them. So I had my alliances and I made my agreement with a lot of different sectors in Qatar, ministries and private sectors and a lot of a lot of other uh, universities as well. So during that phase of my life, I used to feel like a lot of, uh, a lot of the time people were like rejecting me, societies were rejecting me. I used to go to the ministries, I was like, uh, I'm a sky climber, they're like, uh, how old are you? My problem was always the age. It's like, how old are you? And you're also a woman? Who's the board of directors that you have with the company? I was like, no, I'm the CEO. You cannot be the CEO. How you can be the CEO of, 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 of the company that you're talking about who graduated more than 203 people? I was like, yeah, I'm the CEO. So during that period of time, I started to write on my Instagram account some notes to myself, yani to, 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 to motivate myself. And those notes, um, yani a lot of people loved it. I used to write in Arabic. Um, so a publishing house in Kuwait, Darsima, I don't know if you know it. It's in Kuwait. Uh, they saw like my articles online and they told me like, your article are very nice and we think that it's gonna be a good book. I was like, yeah, wallah, then just take them. 
again, another a lot of people think that in order for you to have a book, you you have to be at least in a certain age. You don't have, you, age will never limit your ambitions and the things that you can uh, yeah, any, you can achieve in your life. So uh, they gather all my notes in that small book that called "Be a Successful Leader," and now it's a bestseller in GCC. Um, I want to end up by saying, I feel so sorry for all the women and all the females and all and everyone who lives in societies that do not appreciate women because. I've been to a lot of countries and I've been to a lot of societies and I've seen a lot of people, even here in Qatar and outside of Qatar, who, uh, who, doesn't, who don't have the people who, like, who tells them like you can be whatever you want to be. But at the same time, I could give also the blame to all the women who sit at home and say like society is telling us so that's why we should not. And I, I'm not okay with all the women who look into like her lipstick is the most important thing in her bag. You're, you can wear your lipstick, you can look gorgeous, and you can have the most amazing brain in the world. Become a person with a value, not a person with like a shallow thing and only يعني, look at societies and where they're labeling you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing all your inspiring stories today. Uh, I'm really glad that you put in the effort to come and talk to us today. So jo please join me in giving our panelists a big round of applause. <laughs>